Welcome back to the Drupal Easy Podcast. This is Season 16, Episode 5. My name is Mike Anello, and in today's episode, we'll be talking about the Drupal Recipes Initiative with Jim Birch, one of its organizers. Before we get to the interview, let me tell you about one of Drupal Easy's long-form training courses. Now, if you listen to this podcast, then you've probably heard me mention once or twice our long-form beginner-focused Drupal training course called Drupal Career Online. The course is designed to lay a rock-solid foundation for becoming a professional Drupal developer, and it gets you access to the Drupal Easy learning community. Among the benefits of this are access to our weekly office hours, community mentors, as well as all of our curriculum updates. Class meets twice a week for 12 weeks, starting February 12th. Learn more at drupaleasy.com slash D-C-O. Welcome, Jim Birch. I believe back to the Drupal Easy podcast. I, I don't have it off the top of my head when you were here, but I'm pretty sure we've had you on before some, sometime in the last dozen years. Yeah, you've been doing it a while. So you, uh, you've you been part of Drupal for over 10 years. You're currently engineering manager. Is that your, your title at Canopy? That is my title, yes. What does that mean? Are you So what are you in charge of? You're in charge of engineering, like Scotty? I on the- am... In charge of uh, a wonderful crew of Drupal developers on the build team. So we do large-scale Drupal builds, usually migrations from Drupal 7 and other odd CMSs into modern Drupal. Yeah, so I get to lead some projects every once in a while, and I, but primarily I, I lead the leaders of the builds. Herding cats, as they say. Yes, yeah. wonderful cats. And you are one of the contributors to the Recipes Strategic Initiative, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's start there and explain to me what is a recipe in you know in Drupal context. But you got to do it fast. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna count you down for my thirty seconds. Go. Sure. Okay. So a Drupal recipe is a way to apply functionality to your Drupal instance that is ephemeral, meaning you're not tied to it anymore after it's applied, not installed. And it's a way uh, that Dries introduced in DrupalCon Portland two years ago as having starter templates for the ambitious site builder. So, you know, imagine being able to install a calendar with every little bit that you needed to have events on a calendar. And the nice thing about these recipes, and I'm just going to pile on to what you're saying is, you could add said calendar recipe to an existing site. That's the goal. Correct. Yeah. So with other things like installation profiles and distributions, you are often tied to that starter point and never could you escape it. Whereas, yeah, recipes are meant to be yeah, completely ephemeral. And, you know, once you install that calendar recipe, you could install a blog recipe after that. Yeah, distributions are great for the first 10 minutes. <laughs> and then they're horrible. And that's my opinion, but I think I, th- I think it's a it's a fairly common opinion. Well, I think we'll talk about why does the strategic initiative have distributions in its name, you know, because it was born of the same world. So we do know that there is a place for distributions. You know, there are a lot of really cool distributions like Thunder and Open Social, you know, that definitely have a need. We don't foresee recipes replacing distributions, but being a tool in the toolkit. So there's going to be some things in a distribution where they want to give this functionality to the site owner and it is the site owner's responsibility. So they don't have to ever update features or, you know, continue to update the custom modules that are in there that, update config yeah these distributions you know it's it's a tremendous amount of work for the folks who maintain distributions yeah so and hopefully recipes is gonna kind of be a nice alternative to that i think for the initiative you can keep the name the same keep distributions in the official name of the initiative but just put a strike through the word distributions (laughs) there you go yeah so you know we've reached out to the pain points of distribution maintainers you know, we've been asked if there are a lot of distribution maintainers contributing to the initiative, but really, I think they're really busy maintaining their distributions <laughs> the way they are. So, you know, if they're ever coming out with a 3.0 or a 4.0, yeah. this might be a good tool for them to look at. What's the Greek 
character that's always pushing the stone up the hill. Mm. Oh, I forget. What, but that's what I feel like a distribution maintainer is. They're, they're, sure. they're never getting to the top. It's, it's yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about recipes here. More, we're going to forget about distributions for now. Let's talk about recipes. So, you know, what are they? I mean, to you know, just if I were to imagine what a recipe might be, it would be, you know, just a pile of configuration. You know, basically, like, let, let's take your calendar example. You know, if I wanted to add a calendar to an existing site, I'll probably need at least one module. I'll need maybe a view. I'll need some, maybe some theming on that as well. So maybe that's part of another module that I have to add. So it feels to me like recipes are mainly configuration. Now, am, am I off or? Mainlings are exclusively configuration. Exclusively. Okay. Yes. Recipes do not contain any code. So if you do need to require code for your recipe, you would need to require a, a module or a theme that would provide that code. Recipes can require other recipes. So you can, you can stack recipes that says do this first and then go do this other recipe. But yeah, to get back to your example, you know, think of everything that you have to click together and compose a require to get into that calendar to be done. And that's what a recipe can provide. So I saw a presentation recently from, let's see, Eric uh, Volkernick, I think is how you pronounce yep. his last name, at NEDCAMP on recipes, which kind of inspired me to, to reach out to you for this. And he said that a recipe can specify which of a module's configuration actually gets imported when that recipe is installed. Correct. So maybe talk about that a little bit more and maybe an example, because I think I understand, but it's, you could probably you know explain it a bit more than I could. Sure. So while, when you enable a module using the Drupal admin or Drush, it automatically imports the configuration that's in the slash config folder and the subfolders install optional override, which when a recipe enables a module, it does not do that by default. So you would have to specify if you want to import all of the configs. So you could just say, I'm enabling, you know, the field UI module, and then give me all the config that comes with the field UI module. Terrible example, because field UI probably has no config. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> you could say, specify just which configs you want to okay. in, import after you enable the module. So meta tag is a good example. Meta tag comes with six meta tag defaults and a meta tag dot settings config file. If I didn't want all of those defaults, if I didn't want the 404 and 403 meta tags, I could just specify the four meta tag configs I want to import. So maybe we should take a quick step back because it sounds like recipes are nothing more than, or let me be precise about this. A recipe is a single YAML file. Is that right? The YAML file is the only thing in a recipe project that is required. So what else could there be that's not required? There could be a config folder. Oh, so the recipe itself could have some config that isn't necessarily tied with one of the dependencies of that recipe. Correct. So okay. in our calendar example we would want to create an event content type. Okay, got it. And that would require a content type config, entity view display and an entity form, the fields that go on that. So a field storage and a field field. So that's where you're creating new configuration. But then there would still have to be, if you want it to be themed or if you want to just apply layout or just even just the basic you know, CSS to it, you would still need to do that in another module. So it would kind of make sense that that other module would probably contain the config for the content type and stuff like that. Yes. So what you are talking about uh, has been referred to as recipeception. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, where do all of these things live? You know, could be, yeah. So in, in a module, you could do a hook that says, look over here for the templates and you know, with that, the library that comes along with it or single directory components. So yeah, you could provide additional 
theming templates that kind of work in a custom module that your recipe requires. So we should say, and we'll, we'll talk about this in, in a moment as well, but this is very early days for recipes. This is nothing's in core yet. This is not done. This is like being actively developed as we speak. Definitely. The, the benefit, so yeah, all of the work is being done is in a Drupal project as is with a lot of modern distributions, which this project is a complete fork of Drupal core. It's not like a experimental module that is enabled. It is going to be part of Drupal core. There is a patch created from this, which you can apply to anything above Drupal 9. We support the last minor version of Drupal. So we're just supporting Drupal 10.1 and above. But you can apply this patch to your local Drupal, and then you can do everything recipes can. And you don't even need to deploy this patch core to your environment because you're applying your Drupal recipe, you know, in your development environment, and then you export config and everything is yours. Anyways. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, it is very experimental, but it's very easy to develop locally and not ever touch your production environment with any experimental code. Oh, okay. And that, yeah, that's interesting. I didn't think about it that way. So yeah. All right. That's kind of cool. Yeah. So you could totally develop using a recipe today on your local with this patch on core. And then, as you said, export the configuration and then import that configuration into just a regular unpatched version of Drupal core. Yep. All right. So the thing that really blew my mind watching this presentation at NetCamp was the ability for recipes to alter existing configuration. And that that is where the magic happens. You say magic, I like that just seems difficult and scary for me. The the phrase that was used was config actions, so you can apply some action to config. And I looked it up and there's a module called config actions, but we were talking before the podcast. You said that recipes isn't actually using that module. It's using its own code that was inspired by that module. So kind of talk about that. Talk about what config actions does and maybe an example of where a recipe might want to alter existing configuration. Sure. So I think there's like 17 questions in there. So good luck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. You know, with a, a custom module, you could do the three things I mentioned earlier to config. You could import it. That is, if it doesn't exist, you can import it. If it did exist, it would fail. You can put in an optional folder in your config folder, which would say, you know, mainly used for if you have, let's say, the help module or the tour module, you know, and you could put extra config in there that would be imported if you have those things. And then there's the config override folder, which says, look out world, I don't care what you have on your site. I am just going to erase it and import my config. What you could never do was, say, alter existing configuration, alter somebody else's config like Drupal cores. So the config actions API is meant to hook into existing configuration. And then basically there's a few different ways that you can alter the configuration. So you can just do a simple uh, config, let's call it simple config update. So that's kind of like a, a foo bar. So let's go into the node.settings configuration and set the use admin theme to true. Go into the user.settings and set the register for Drupal to admin only. So you can go in, you know, to me, it's like the first four hours of every Drupal site. <laughs> you know, I will go in and click all the things that I don't want set up, you know, no matter if I install with a minimal profile or a standard profile, but you can do really cool things like set the admin theme to Jin and the front end theme to Olivero. And then even then in Jin's admin theme settings, you could go in and set it to dark mode and you set the different colors and, you know, do a lot of things. So that's the basic config action. There is another one called ensure exists. This is kind of mysterious one to us still, but to check validation on a configuration. So this is how we might be able to work around optional. So if user 
role exists, do this to it. Right. Or if a content type exists or a vocabulary exists. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I actually have it on my list to, to play with that a little bit more today. There are a couple entity methods. So grant permissions is one. Oh, okay. So, you know, as you're adding functionality and you have user roles, you'll want to definitely check boxes on the permission page. And that grant permissions action is one of those. There's set filter config, which goes into CK editor and, and does a few things. So all of this seems like something that as a, as a developer who is applying a recipe, or I don't know what the right verb is going to be, you know, when you take a recipe and add it to your site. Apply is correct. I would want to know, like, what, like, I can kind of almost tolerate the fact that there's going to be some config imported, right? There's going to be some new config because that's kind of my expectation. I'm adding a calendar recipe. I better freaking have an event content type or something like that that I expect. But I think I would also expect that if that recipe is going to mess with existing config, I'd like to know about it and be able to say, okay, proceed. Or, whoa, stop, I don't want to do this yet. Is, is it safe to assume there's going to be some type of are you sure step in there? There is an issue for it uh, that we've created. Early days, um, I get well, it. I'm, I'm yeah, just kind of yeah. thinking out loud as I as I... If I were to apply one, like what would I, what would my expectation be? So you as a worldly Drupal developer may want this, but I'm not sure an ambitious site builder would know or care about this. Well, that's true. Okay. You could, you know, look at the, you could look at the recipe file and see exactly <laughs> what you will, you will get a git diff before you push that's to. That's true. Okay. Your local, <laughs> but we do have the idea of prompts for like something like a language. So, like we're installing, you know, something that gets into the translation system of Drupal, and you know, like you know, maybe a prompt like, "What languages do you want to install with that with this recipe?" So you didn't mention anything about like configuration getting deleted, though, right? Correct. I don't know. I don't know if configuration can be deleted by a recipe. Yeah, because that could potentially destroy data. Yes. Yeah, so that seems like that we have to be very careful about that. So that brings up a really good segue into what the the backend team of the recipes initiative is working on is configuration validation. So while the configuration management system in Drupal core is amazing, the guys figured out that none of it's validated. So you could import configuration that just does nothing into Drupal, your Drupal instance, or could break something. The configuration isn't ever validated. So that's what they're working on right now to help ensure that, yeah, you're not going to do bad things when you import a recipe. But where does config schema fit into all that? Because that's kind of validated. It is. It will config schema defines what, the fields are, but it, nothing's validated in it, to my understanding. So yeah, there's a tag called configuration validation in the Drupal core issue queue, where there's a ton of work going on right now. They're yeah, making great I've, I've seen some of that going on. Yeah, yeah, that's a big, that's a big thankless job, right? It, it totally is, and it, it's kind of like the groundwork that needs to happen to ensure that. A recipe is, you know, if it fails halfway during through during an install, yeah, what do you do? doesn't <laughs> totally bork your site, <laughs> which is something Wim Lears and Fena Proxima and Alex Pot have been working on the past month, and you know, just seeing these issues go by, and and we've gotten to a point now where yes, if a recipe fails to apply, it will just revert back to to zero of your your site. So doing something with called config snapshots, which is going to take a picture of your config before you apply the recipe and after you apply a recipe. Isn't this, I mean, I, I, this is fantastic though, because you think about like all the work that went into Drupal's configuration system between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. And now we're kind of just building on top of that in a way that, you know, we, we didn't even like, 
couldn't even think of five years ago. Yeah. I, I think that, that's, that's pretty freaking cool. If you ask me. Yeah. And it's not, it's not, you know, configuration 2.0. It, it is just iterative steps on just making it better and safer. Who knew that we were going to be talking about configuration for the bulk of this pod? I guess you probably <laughs> figured we would be, but all right. So I know you're not going to give me an answer or a specific answer, but maybe just a general, very, very hand wavy answer. What, what time are we looking for? Is there like, are we thinking maybe Drupal 11 will have an experimental module? And these are my words, not yours. So I'm sure. just throwing something out there. It, it will never be an experimental module. Oh, that's right. You mentioned that. Yeah, yeah because it is, I mean, it is like baked in, uh, baked into to Drupal core. So okay. yeah, because that, yes, I declined to answer that question at this time. <laughs> my, uh, my suspicion would be, you know, 11, one, 11, two. Okay. But yeah, it depends on how much contribution we can get right now. It's a very small yeah. team that works right. on this initiative. I would also say, you know, I will put these words in your mouth. You don't know what you don't know. Correct. Right? More things can come up. Yeah. So that that's why it's great for experimentation right now. You know, I am definitely not a backend developer. I'm, you know, mm-hmm. like you said earlier, I'm more the manager of, of people now. But I am definitely a recipe creator. And as I create recipes, I find things that I go back to the the backend team and say, Hey, what about this? Hey, what about that? (laughs) You know, going on podcasts like this and talking at conferences, people ask really great questions. You know, you can see them process the information and, and come up with ways that they would use it, you know, so like come up with, you know, I put proof of concept issues in the issue queue. Hey, can we do this? You know, I, I was on another podcast a month ago or two ago and Somebody asked, you know, does it work with the new Drupal starter theme? So, you know, we talked about a scenario how that would work, you know, whereas you have a theme, you require a theme, and then you clone the theme using that method, and then you get rid of the original theme. So, I mean, it's a cool process. I haven't worked all the way through it, but (laughs) I could see how it would be a cool thing. Like, yeah, let's clone, you know, Olivero and, and use the Drupal. Yeah start a theme functionality to clone it into your own theme. And then you don't need Olivero after that. So how do we get rid of it? Let's talk about a little bit. If someone wanted to play with this today, kind of like the way you're talking about it is creating a recipe and just playing with it. It sounds like the steps would be, you know, get a fresh copy of Drupal on your local, apply the core patch. All, links to all this stuff will be in the, in the show notes. Apply the core patch. I don't, I, I'm going to say, go on a limb, there's probably no documentation yet for this stuff. You probably just have to look at existing recipes somewhere in the issue queue. There is a uh, link from the project page. There is a 1.x branch in our repository that has documentation that is, you know, ever evolving. Linked, also linked to from the project page is I created a cookbook of existing recipes. Oh, Okay where, you know, basically I just link to, I think it's broken out into like site starters, you know, which is, you know, what every agency wants. We, you know, I want to save that four hours at the beginning of every project. So there's three of those. I'm starting to deal with a lot of micro recipes. So I love the idea of having an off the shelf recipe that I can grab that adds, you know, the gin admin experience to a site which is you know to me it's the gin theme the gin login module the gin toolbar module so there's more than just the theme you know there's a couple modules in there setting a password policy so i have one that sets up a 90-day password policy that says you must change your password every 90 days and it can't be one of the last 12 so you know something that our support team gets asked all the time you know if i could narrow that down from three hours a task to 30 minutes you know, that would save our clients a bunch of money. And But aren't you, by, by doing that, and I'm not picking on you by any stretch, but I'm just saying, like, in order to do that, like you said, the gin admin experience, we'll call it. Yeah. It sounds, well, correct me if I'm wrong, would, would all of that be wrapped up into a single recipe? I, I just For some reason in my head, I was thinking you're moving the work of maintaining a distribution from maintaining a distribution to maintaining 
a recipe, but you're not really, you don't really have to maintain that recipe because it's a one and done when someone applies. It. Yeah. So I, if I do update that recipe, I don't have to worry about breaking the 200 sites that used it before. Right, 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 right. All right. So let's say someone builds their own recipe or, or, or grabs one of the ones, you know, from the, from the, the, the links you're talking about, how do they apply it? So there is a core shell script in Drupal. Oh, okay. Old school. Yes. So this is, you know, it's at var core PHP Drupal, I think is the location. And that runs the recipe runner that is in core and applies the recipe. So recipes are set up like uh, your modules in themes folder. So you have, you know, where you have slash modules, you'd have slash recipes, you know, in that the idea of you have a core and contrib. Contrib and custom. Cut, yeah, contrib and custom folders in that. So yeah, you just run this script and say where the recipe is and apply it. With local recipes, you have to make sure you maintain all of your dependencies. We have some commands uh, and some documentation to help you use contributed recipes from other repositories that have composer.json files. Because I have to host the gin admin theme, I need to require the gin admin theme and the gin login and the gin toolbar modules. So I have that in a package that can be installed using composer. The next cool tool is a module called, or a package, a composer installer package called Drupal Recipe Unpack. So if you have required a recipe using Composer and you have those dependencies now that because you installed it using Composer, Drupal Recipe Unpack takes the dependencies and unpacks it to your project's composer.json file. So it would take the gin login, the gin theme, and the gin toolbar dependencies and put them in your site's composer.json. Oh, so we'll literally insert those in the require section of, oh, of okay. your, your site. So yeah, literally. That's kind of what you want is that now you own the puppy and you have to maintain those modules. Yes. Okay. So you're not relying on the recipe to maintain the modules. Yeah. So it is a little, you know, sticky right now to, to get this all set up, but there is an issue to put that into the rest of the package into the, the core project. Yeah. So there's a roadmap. There is. Is that roadmap still accurate? Is it up to date? And it's okay to say no. I'm just curious. It probably needs some review. Okay. Fair enough. The biggest, you know, we, we, we've taken some detours with this config management because you don't know what you don't know when you, you right. make roadmaps at the beginning. Or sorry, config validation. The biggest thing to getting to a, a release is that the idea of in being able to import content with your recipe. Oh, okay. So not just, yeah, not just configuration YAML files, but the idea that you could put content YAML files along with those. So once you, once you created your event content type and your event content type fields, we need a way to populate the content because definitely like populate the taxonomies that your filters need. You know, if you have a filtered view or a filtered calendar, that's kind of like the last big hurdle that nobody's looked at yet, that it would be needed for an ambitious site builder to install these things. So is that going to build upon an existing contrib module or is that going to be all new or unknown at this point? The, the idea, the current running plan is that it would be really cool if the default content contrib module would, would be moved into core and we could use that. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Cause I think still core initiatives, core projects can't require something that's in contrib. Right. So that, that would need to be in core also. But yeah, that's the last big hurdle on the roadmap to getting it into core. So let's talk even further down the line, because I think when people think about recipes and the ambitious site builder, it would be great if there was a place you could go and browse recipes and click a button and have that recipe automatically install. 
which is pretty much what Project Browser is going to bring to Drupal for projects, for, for modules and base themes and things like that. And it, it's, it's on the roadmap. It is. It's phase three on the roadmap. So, I mean, that's, that's a ways out. I'm sure there's no work happening on that yet, but is that kind of the, the end point as far as we know? Like, is that like the ultimate goal at this point? Absolutely. And we actually saw a demo yesterday that Adam Fenaproxima made where he created a project browser plugin that said, look at this folder and, and find this recipe and, and was able to do a pretty good, quick and dirty proof of concept Oh, that's exciting! with the project browser. Yeah. So yeah. You know, definitely a lot of things need to happen. Project browser, the way they did build the endpoint plugins is amazing that it is expandable like that. To do that, we would need to have a new project type on drupal.org called recipe. We would need to update composer Drupal scaffold and composer installers to have a Drupal recipes type. Right now we're doing that all by hand thanks to the Oomph Inc. plugin, composer plugin. So yeah, it's it it's not trivial that that happens, but it is a hundred percent doable. Yeah. So that would be a really cool way for ambitious site builders to discover existing recipes that could yeah, just one click and install and yeah. and bang, you got your calendar and plug in and you didn't have to pay for it or <laughs> didn't break your site. <laughs> so, all right, let's wrap this up. If folks are interested and want to learn more or even help out, give me like two or three places that they can go. Sure. So the most discussion happens in the Drupal Slack. It is the distribution and recipes channel. We meet every other week on Tuesdays where we have an asynchronous meeting. So you don't have to necessarily be there on time, but you know, we create topics to discuss and, and put in links. There is the distribution and recipes project where we have an issue queue and reach out to me. We have de definitely have skill level or we have something for every skill level. You know, so we have documentation tasks for writers and we have, you know, a lot of proof of concept and recipe creation issues or tasks for site builders and YAML creators. And then there's a lot of backend issues too. Is there one good place where people can go to get started and basically says, download Drupal core, apply this patch using, you know, this, and then do that. Like what's the, is there a place people can go to like run those three or four steps and be able to see something? Yeah. The, I have a, a task to wrap up a, a, a getting started document, but that is, that is or will be linked to from the project page. All right, perfect. So yeah, yeah, go into the distribution and recipes project page is, is probably the best starting point. All right, all these links will be in the show notes. Jim, always great catching up with you. Yeah, sure. Thank you for all your hard work and uh, everyone on the team. It's a it's a pretty good team. It is. From from what I've seen. So I'm, I'm sure you'll find success soon enough. Yeah. One thing I'd like to leave you with, like contributing to these initiatives, you know, it's kind of like, you know, if you've ever gone to a Drupal camp or a Drupal meetup and, you know, if you, if you go once, you know, everybody's super nice. If you go twice, you know, you're going to get invited to the hosting committee or, or something like that, you exactly. know, if you, and if you show up to that, you, you know, you're a lifer. You know? <laughs> so at DrupalCon Pittsburgh, you know, I gave my presentation where you're at, you know, I, I got to say, I don't know. And, I'll have to get back to you a lot in that because of all the great questions. But, you know, we had a, a table in the contribute room, maybe six people there consistently working on a lot of just getting it set up. Alex Pot, the maintainer at the time, wrote all the code for this. So the, the base code was on sabbatical. So, you know, it was kind of like a, bu a bunch of site builders trying to figure out back end code and how to make this all work. <laughs> and, you know, we, we, contributed every day of, of DrupalCon Pittsburgh for four hours or so. And by the end of it, we got one issue committed. This was a, a config action called set component. This is like how you, you'd add a field to an existing content type. Took us a lot. We updated a lot of documentation, but I was... Instead of you know, Project Browser probably finished a hundred issues in that time. <laughs> you know, but we we can we contributed one issue 
to the effort. Yeah, but if it's mainly new contributors, I mean, that's that's pretty typical, right? It takes a while to get everybody ramped up and and just yeah, just comfortable with this with you know with what's there. Uh, and and it was great because this one issue you know, added a whole nother config action. So we added 25% to the config actions <laughs> effort. We got a bunch of long-term committers and yeah. initiative Great. efforts. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, any, any help definitely helps. Any insight definitely helps. Like what would you use it for? I get a ton of great questions every time I talk about it. So yeah, if you're interested, please come on out. All right, cool. Thanks for being here, Jim. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Drupal Easy Podcast. Don't forget to check out all of our long-form Drupal training courses at DrupalEasy.com and stay tuned for the next episode of the Drupal Easy Podcast. See ya!